Hello folks. Tonight I'm going to talk to you about distilling, or simplifying if you will, the Microsoft Cybersecurity Reference Architecture, uh, which describes Microsoft's cybersecurity capabilities and how they integrate with existing environments and security architectures. I am Pete Zerger. I'm a Microsoft MVP for a few years now, currently in, in Azure. Uh, I'm a CISSP. Uh, at least part of my time, 9 to 5, is, is dedicated to uh, being a virtual chief information security officer for a financial services organization, a, a contract CISO, if you will. I am the uh, product owner at LumaGate for Simon, the first AI-powered chatbot uh, for making managing the Microsoft Cloud easier. It has a very heavy cybersecurity focus. We, we spend a lot of time uh, making managing identities and devices easier. We integrate with uh, components like uh, Defender ATP and Azure AD Identity Protection and Privileged Identity Management. Uh, and in fact, we were re Simon was recently showcased at the Microsoft Build Conference where the uh, topic of a Microsoft case study, so uh, something I'm quite proud of. Uh, but I'll stop talking about that now. But, but really everything I do focuses on, on Azure. I've, I've spent a fair bit of time in, in DevOps uh, cybersecurity, uh, strategic discussions around architecture, be it be it client uh, or or cloud, but uh, but that's who I am. And tonight, I'm what I'm really going to do is whether you're really knowledgeable about the Microsoft cybersecurity stack or or you're new to the Microsoft cybersecurity stack. And if you're new, this is going to be significant for you. I want to take that uh, idea of the Microsoft cybersecurity reference architecture and give you a top-down approach that you can use to move forward in protecting your infrastructure and your, your devices and, and client endpoints and identities and your apps and your, your information, securing your data, uh, on out into security operations. But I'm, I'm going to give you a process where even if you're not very knowledgeable, you can move forward uh, using a method that's simple to improve your cybersecurity posture as you learn the Microsoft cybersecurity stack and how those components fit together. So first, just a couple of, of freebies so we can get these out of the way. Um, I am an instructor at LinkedIn Learning. I have quite a few different uh, cybersecurity related courses over there. My latest is an AZ500 exam prep series. So if you are somebody looking to certify, get in touch with me on LinkedIn for an activation code. I can give you a, a 90 day free pass to LinkedIn Premium, which includes access to the entire catalog of LinkedIn Learning Courses. There is the uh, the URL for the book, again, Inside Azure Management, which, which is what inspired uh, putting this event together. 650 plus pages across a very broad range of Azure management topics. There's a great uh, chapter in there on Azure governance. Uh, Stan did some really great work around configuration management and Azure automation, some of which he talked with you about earlier in the day. So why do you want to spend the next hour with me? Uh, because you're going to walk away from here with an actionable plan, regardless of your knowledge level. If you're really knowledgeable on the Microsoft cybersecurity stack, I'm going to give you a new way of thinking about that reference architecture. If you don't understand how these components fit together all that well yet, I'm going to give you a method that you can move forward tomorrow. Uh, without understanding that stack and take incremental steps to improve your posture as you assimilate uh, that reference architecture in to your body of knowledge. But I want you to walk away from here with three things tonight, okay? So I mentioned that reference architecture is big. You got that. Uh, but I want to show you a top-down approach and you with a top-down approach starting with identity. Since identity is the perimeter, it really all starts there. Uh, we can ease the journey. And Microsoft provides dashboards that can guide your focus, that can tell you what the next thing is you should be doing. That high impact, low effort, low cost next step that makes your security posture just a little bit better. And we can distill these capabilities, we can simplify these capabilities using first principles methods. So what are first principles methods? Well, it's, it's more or less a way to take a big topic and break it down into its simplest form. So let me give you an example. Uh, a book is composed of pages. 
and pages are composed of paragraphs. And if I take those paragraphs, I can break those down into words, and I can break those words down into letters. So I'm I'm deconstructing the uh, the topic, uh, and, and then you know, oftentimes putting it back together, uh, having broken it down into its simplest form. Here, I'm just going to show it to you. I'm just going to hit you right in the gut. Look at that. Look at all of those words, all of those arrows. Uh, Andrew, you said you were just getting into the game. How do you feel about this? How, how does that look to you right now? That that can be daunting. This is actually a very useful diagram. So we're going to take this and we're going to break it down a little bit. We're going to simplify. So there's one thing I can do here if you're new to cybersecurity. Let's take these and put these into, into buckets. Here we go. Here's the reference architecture in some high-level buckets. We can digest these, right? So we've got software as a service up there, Office 365, Dynamics, third-party services like Dropbox. Uh, we've got identity and access where we'll th find things like Azure AD. We'll find conditional access, but we're going to break these down as we go. We can, we can think about information protection, and it doesn't take long to, to realize that uh, you know, that's where Azure Information Protection lives. But, you know, the reality is there are lots of integrations here. These things work together, right? So but let's just talk a minute about the threat landscape and we'll just go down the, the rabbit hole here. So so I think we all understand, uh, you know, ba based on Chelsea's discussion alone, that the, the threat actors we're working with today are far more sophisticated than they used to be. These are very organized, very skilled, well-funded, uh, albeit lazy people sometimes. Uh, but they're not the script kiddies, you know, that stole my AOL password in 1990-something. They're much more sophisticated in that respect. Um, and so we find these adversaries uh, are, you know, sometimes nation states. They are, are skilled cyber criminals that are out there gathering your your information for, for money, right, in exchange for payment. Um, and we look at all these threats, and you know, when, I, when I'm prioritizing threats, I'm, I'm trying to do the math on, on what is the most likely way an attacker is coming in the door. It says phishing at the top of the list there, because that's the one, the, the number one threat I see in most environments. Uh, there was a survey done two or three years ago, and they said more than nine out of 10 uh, breaches start with a phishing attack or a spear phishing attack. They're coming in the door via email. So very, very targeted and and to Chelsea's point, not always very sophisticated. Sometimes they're just preying on organizations that are working in a legacy world where they haven't used the tools that they're avail to protect their environment. And Microsoft provides us a lot of intelligent security. And some of this requires uh, you know more licensing than others. So so you know Microsoft the Microsoft 365 uh, security the the suite. Uh, has an E3 tier, it has an E5 tier, and when we jump from the E3 tier to the E5 tier, that's often where we are jumping into the world of intelligent security. We're getting that automation, we're getting functionality like Defender Advanced Threat Protection, which gives us uh, really great, uh, you know, endpoint defend and, and response, and and the ca the capabilities to take actions on machines where we can isolate a machine, we can we can explore that machine in real time, we can initiate sample collection. So so a lot of those powerful capabilities do require an additional level of licensing. So what I will say is if if you have an Azure environment or you can light up an Azure trial, what you can do is get 30 days of virtually all of these services. Uh, on a trial basis for free. You can you can light up a lot of that intelligent security, Office 365, Advanced Threat Protection, Defender ATP, uh, Microsoft Cloud App Security. All of that's possible because at the end of the day, we need to, to really have an approach that looks at protecting all of our, our assets from, from our, our infrastructure, our servers, and and customized devices, our endpoints, you know, like workstations and mobile devices, um, our identities, whether whether our identities are in Azure AD or or Active Directory on prem or both, uh, you know, we have to have a strategy for that and and really getting down to that content. And you know, to Chelsea's point, she she mentioned that you know we we deploy tools like Defender ATP because they give us you know, visibility and they give us capability, right? And, and the Microsoft Threat Protection Suite in general 
gives us what I like to call context. We can look at situations in the context of, you know, Defender ATP, for example, is very endpoint focused um, because it's really targeting Windows 10 and Defender's expanded beyond Windows 10 to servers and so forth. So we, we can go further, but it's really endpoint focused. And, and Office 365 ATP is, is um, you know, really just email and collab focused and cloud app security focuses more on apps and and Azure Active Directory is more identity focused. With, with the threat protection suite, we get some visibility across these stacks, the ability to hunt across these stacks. Um, so let's let's just break, and, and I'm oversimplifying here, but let's just break down what an attacker is trying to do and think about how we can respond um, from, from this. So an attacker's goal is to leverage our identities and our endpoints to steal valuable information. They want something of valuable they can go off and sell. They may be selling our identities. They may be, you know, instead getting getting to customer information. They might they might you know steal an identity and leverage an endpoint, and then move laterally through our environment until they find that high value target that has customer data, for example, right? So, so we can take that. Uh, cybersecurity reference architecture and start to break it down a little bit. So when we think about um, the uh, the reference architecture in the context of identity uh, and access and information protection, the first thing that comes to my mind is I can light up uh, MFA, like Chelsea said, right? Just turn on MFA, step one. Um, and then we can layer in some some additional capability they're using Azure AD conditional access which will allow us to, and you can see that just right there, um, pretty high up. So that will allow us to evaluate a user's authentication attempt and look at you know, not only their identity, but where their location, where they're logging from, the state of their device, the app that they are accessing uh, our information from. So we can look, we can take all of that context and make a decision. And we can also, if we have Azure Active Directory Plan 2, which includes identity protection, we can add the additional capability of looking at the risk associated with the attempt. So as Chelsea mentioned, you know, when you have an attempt that comes from a place that a user would normally never travel, that's going to elevate the risk. And we can define in that conditional access policy how to respond to that user. And it may be something as simple as give them a second factor, prompt them to go to, you know, their the authenticator app and validate the authentication. So we know because at that point they're tied to that device where, where the authenticator app is, right? So, so now we've got greater assurance. We've, re, we've increased our certainty and reduced our risk around that situation. So, so definitely a great way to, uh, to approach it. And, and if you're not using MFA, you need to turn on MFA, but if you're not using conditional access, um, we would not survive a week without it, we'd we'd be in trouble. You have to, you, you really have to look at it. it. It's a fundamental capability. But the, uh, the the reference architecture has a number of of pretty good uses for you. It's, it's definitely a starting template for a security architecture. You can use it as a comparison reference. So as you go through the 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 top down approach that I'm going to show you, you could use the reference architecture to kind of refer back and see what are the capabilities in that silo and what more can I do than what I'm seeing in this dashboard. Um, if you're somebody that's trying to, to, to just get more ingrained in, in your cybersecurity knowledge, it's a great way to learn about Microsoft's cybersecurity capabilities, but it's also a great way to learn about how these products integrate with one another. So, so there's a lot of, of integration between uh, the different components within the Microsoft cybersecurity suite. So understanding how they come together is really important. And I, I have time to show you a couple of those today, which I will. So let's talk about this, this top-down approach and get our hands on it. So, so what I mentioned here is that there are dashboards out there that can provide insights that help you identify deficiencies in your environment, even if you don't know the Microsoft cybersecurity stack all that well, and you have to do very little to enable any of these capabilities. In fact, I promise that after we finish this session, you should be able to do all of these things 
uh, and and understand exactly what you can go back to your desk and do right now if heaven forbid you're going to work at this time of night, uh, depending on where you are. So let's start with the uh, the first uh, component here that that uh, Chelsea mentioned, uh, which is secure score. So I'm going to show you secure. I'm going to just show you a secure score dashboard in one of my lab environments. So here here I've got a secure score environment. Uh, or a secure score report that's giving me some information about what's not right in my environment. It's kind of showing me where where do you where do you sit right now on a scale of one to perfect, and and what do you have in your environment that's not compliant? So if I scroll through here, you can see it's showing me I have room to improve. And if I click on improve my score, now. Uh, so of course it's having trouble. Let me just try to refresh the page here. Let's give it a second here. If it won't, uh, if it won't drill down, we'll keep it high level. But uh, it says it's waiting here. The cloud seldom cooperates, and uh, this would be one of those times. I'm just going to back up. I'll just back up to the home page here, and we'll we'll keep going. But I can drill down here, and what the secure score is going to give me is a list of tasks that I, a list of, of remediations I can perform, and and they are organized for me. They're prioritized based on their impact and their effort. So so the high impact, low effort items are at the top of that list. So so I like to say, you know, show me show me a list that puts the red paint at the top. Show me, don't show me what's good. Show me the two percent that's bad or the twenty percent that's bad, and what I need to do to fix it. And that's exactly what this dashboard is doing. Now you see over here we have 84 privileged OAuth apps. We have a lot of interesting activity going on over there, uh, usually related to my development team. In this case, it looks like in this lab it's related to my development lead. Um, but the secure score, you go to security.microsoft.com. You do have to be you know, fully licensed to get that full capability. But if you don't have the full secure score, you're gonna see a, a scorecard in another place here that I'll show you in just a minute, and that is Azure Security Center. And I'm going to show you uh, with Azure Security Center, a tool that has some great advanced capabilities if you pay for the standard tier, but they also have a free tier that's accessible to everybody. And it's there by default if you're working in Azure. So I wanna to talk to you about another way that we can, we can kind of overlay the Microsoft capabilities, thinking about attackers in a kind of a more real world pragmatic way. So this is the, the site, what they call the cyber kill chain. And this is an old school cyber kill chain that was developed by Lockheed Martin. It's one that's very commonly used and that's why I'm showing it to you because you'll find it everywhere. And uh, when we look at the, the, uh, the process of, of a breach, it starts with reconnaissance. It, it starts with weaponization. They they look at our they look at us. They footprint us. They use um, you know they use Google searches. They they probe to see what services we have listening, and and they weaponize. And what these first two elements have in common is these all happen before that uh, that threat actor has ever really touch attempted to touch our environment they can passively understand a lot and weaponize before they they come at us and then they can work their way through you know delivering that uh that threat you know be it through something like uh like a phishing email right and then exploiting and, and establishing uh, an installation on a system moving laterally establishing command and control so they can then talk to those those uh, compromised endpoint and then you know acting on their objective so so there's a very logical path here and what i can do very simply is is take the cyber security reference architecture and the capabilities i see in each of those silos that we saw and i can map them to the kill chain so incidentally there's another there's a cloud kill chain out there that uh, would be considered a bit more modern and you're going to find some some common elements here but i wanted to give you something that conceptually is very easy for us to follow and very relevant still today. So if I just take this architecture, I can map very simply my Microsoft capabilities to it. And this is by no means 100% um, uh, comprehensive, but you'll see you'll see a lot of things we've, we've talked about here today. So 
uh, you know, for these first two elements, if I get multi-factor authentication in there, conditional access, identity protection, if I get Azure Sentinel in here, gathering my logs, um, I'm going to have a lot of visibility into to some of the things that are happening here as they're passively or actively probing my environment. If I see a, a high number of, of DNS queries, if I see port scans, et cetera, you know, I'm going to pick that up in Azure Sentinel. If I see um, repeated attempts to authenticate to, to my accounts, um, you know, I'm going to see that in the Azure AD logs. And if I'm using uh, multi-factor authentication and conditional access, 100% of those um, attempts should be uh, unsuccessful, particularly if I get identity protection in there. If I have those first three thing, first three elements properly in implemented, I'm going to, to really have strong defenses here that will protect my front door. If I go a little bit further, Chelsea mentioned um, Defender ATP, really important here. We can look at Defender Antivirus and, and laying in Exploit Guard, which has multiple elements for, for helping protect against um, malicious activity. Credential Guard, which in Windows 10 will, will encrypt our domain passwords and memory. You, you couple that with the local, uh, the, with the LAP solution for the local account password solution. And, and now, we're in a really strong position because we don't have a common um, we don't have a common local admin account and password, and we've got our credentials encrypted in memory, which means that if I drop an if a, an attacker drops malware on that endpoint and they can dump credentials from memory, when they dump memory, they're going to find that the credentials are encrypted. So we've now taken that that step. So if I keep going here, just just thinking about those capabilities, you know, Defender and, and Defender ATP are going to protect me all the way out here. And with Defender ATP, we can automate investigation as well. So Defender ATP, when, when it sees a problem, can go out and investigate one endpoint automatically or a thousand endpoints automatically. And I can, and it can tell me what um, I should do. And in fact, Defender ATP out of the box will, uh, it, it works in semi-automated fashion to begin with. Defender ATP will tell me what it thinks I should do, but, it, but ask me to approve it. And when I get to a point of full comfort, I could even fully automate that and tell Defender ATP, if you see something that's, that's serious, you know, take care of it for me. Go ahead and, and identify and remediate. Um, but but you know, this, is, this is the value of a layered defense right here. What you're seeing are layers of the steps in an attack that, that map to layers of defense. I don't have to catch that threat actor at every, every layer, but I've got to catch them at one of them, don't I? I've got to get them before they, before they fully establish their footprint. If I, don't, if I don't catch them by step five on this kill chain, I'm now in post-breach territory, and that's where I'm really hoping I have Defender ATP in place, which is going to, to be a really strong tool in in identifying those post uh, breach activities when it's, go it's going to find that malicious activity. It's going to spot command and control. Defender ATP can very reliably spot uh, a conversation in a command and control scenario where uh, malware on my endpoint is talking to a malicious IP, you know, talking to that threat actor's uh, control center. So let's talk about Azure Security Center. So this is another dashboard we can use to very easily give ourselves visibility into our environment. And if you think back to that reference architecture that I showed you that had um, identity and access and information protection and hybrid infrastructure, you're going to see some things that look very familiar on the Security Center dashboard. So we're going to look at using Security Center first and then i'm going to show you briefly how easy it is to set security center up because it is so easy so if you come to this dashboard you don't know microsoft's uh cybersecurity stack all that well and that reference architecture is something you're just working your way through you'll notice that the dashboard is very logically organized so we have policy and compliance up here and and behind the scenes what you have here is azure policy uh, basically checking our environment for regulatory compliance against common standards like PCI DSS, like CIS, like uh, SOC. Um, there, there are just a handful of these that are enabled by default, 
but there are others that we can enable uh, quite easily in the interface. And if we click into those compliance initiatives, you see we get um, a little tabbed interface here and we can drill down into the areas where we are not compliant. So, so let's say I'm not an Azure CIS specialist. That is a very true statement. Ask me to tell you all of the things or even half of the, half of the items that are checked here. I cannot do it. But Microsoft through Security Center, through through the policy they've implemented here, have checked my environment and they are surfacing to me here things that I can fix. And the important things are at the top. So you'll notice here it tells me how many resources. It tells me the type of resource. And it says I need to enable secure transfer to storage accounts. Uh, and, and I'll have to be careful about that because there are some functions that you can break if you turn on secure. Uh, transfer over in the open source world. But if I find that none of those are true in my environment, the quick fix indicator there tells me that basically I can drill down in here, I can check some boxes. And when I say remediate, the quick fix is going to go enable that for me on all of those impacted resources automatically. It's quick, it's easy. I didn't have to be an expert in Azure storage security. It was done for me. But now I sure know that that's very important, right? So I just gained a piece of knowledge because I'm working from the top down. I'm working from the high level dashboard that's showing me the big picture and the important areas where I need to focus. So let's just get down into the resource security hygiene. So I'm right here in the, the middle pane and I'll just click on recommendations. And this is going to show me the recommendations across all of the elements of, of security in, in my environment. So this is going to give me a lot of information, but I want you to look at that column on the right. And you notice there, we see a, a lot of red paint up at the top, right? They're showing me what I need to focus on first, which is super, super important. And if I just click under remediate vulnerabilities here, it's telling me some things I need to focus on. So it says, hey, you need to turn on the vulnerability assessment solution for your virtual machines, for your SQL server. And you notice those quick fix indicators there. So it's giving me high impact, low effort items right at the top of my inbox. Now you'll notice here that, that I've enabled um, um, the, uh, I've, I've enabled the uh, vulnerability assessment already for my machines here because Microsoft added a new capability in the standard tier of Security Center and it's a vulnerability assessment for my virtual machines that also looks at my SQL instances on virtual machines. It uses a third party tool called Qualys and it comes at no additional cost for the standard tier customer. But even if you don't have the standard tier of Security Center, if you just have the free tier, you're going to find a lot of, of guidance in the free tier, like turning on that uh, secure, that, that encryption in transit for your storage, that's gonna show up in the free tier of Security Center. It's, it's when we get into the intelligent defense and into some of the automated remediation elements, that's where we're gonna see that the E5 tier uh, comes up. So I'll just drill into to compute and apps here. So now I'm now I'm looking more along that cybersecurity reference architecture. You remember they had identity and access. They had my hybrid infrastructure. So that's really going to roughly map to compute and apps. But if I go under compute and apps, I'm an engineer. I've worked with virtual machines. This is my spot, right? So if I'm that engineer who's worked works with virtual machines every day, I can come in here and I can see that I have items that need to be dealt with. And those color codings you see, red is, is high, orange is medium, blue is low. And for that particular virtual machine, I can come down here and I can see everything that needs to be addressed on that resource. So this is basically giving me not only the, the, be, the deviation from best practices, but how I need to fix these things. And because it's implemented through policy, Microsoft can evolve this guidance very, very quickly at the speed of the cloud. It's, it's very impressive in that respect. Let's go into identity and access. We saw that on Microsoft's 
reference architecture. So as I'm working through that reference architecture before I really know everything uh, about the Microsoft stack, you'll notice here I'm pretty green. I told you identity is where it starts for me. Um, I, I, I tend to lock down identity hard in any environment, even if I'm demonstrating. So you'll notice here there's a lot of green because frankly, it's all green. I do have a deprecated account that needs to be removed from my system here. Um, and, and it's just giving me a, a blocked account that I need to uh, remove. It's actually my demo account that I intentionally put out here in block. So you'd see something in red. Um, I can look at my data. So, so thinking about information protection, I can look at my data. And here um, I'm seeing, you'll notice I'm, I'm seeing multiple facets of my data. So I have my overall list here, but I can scroll over and I can see focus on SQL on storage, getting into my Redis cache. We do some pretty weird stuff with Simon, our bot. Data lakes, data lake stores. I removed something there in the lab pretty recently, or right? I'd have something there and I can drill down into those particular stores. And again, I get the, I get the impact and I get the quick fixes there, the low effort things that I can do to make my environment more secure quickly and easily that's really what it's it's all about is how do i how do i take that reference architecture which has a whole bunch of guidance and figure out where i really need to start acting in my environment first and so security center is giving me a lot of that visibility right here in the uh, the dashboard um, there's actually uh, visibility into your network security as well um, so with the standard tier of, of Security Center, we have the added capability of being able to deploy an agent out to our virtual machines that are on premises. So, so the free tier of Security Center is going to give you that E3 level of protection. It's going to give you insights into to what I call the bare necessities. When we go to the standard tier, we're getting that E5 license level of protection. We're getting intelligence. We're getting uh, coverage for hybrid uh, by, by giving us that extension into our on-premises endpoints. Um, it gives us um, you know, access to the advanced cloud defenses, including just-in-time VM access. So, so with just-in-time VM access, um, I can essentially uh, enable uh, a, a request system. So if you want access to a virtual machine, you actually have to request access. You are approved. And when we turn that on, I can specify the time range. Like in this environment, I only allow three hours. And what it does is actually uh, just-in-time VM access manipulates the uh, network security group rules on this, uh, the, the, the subnet for this VM to allow access for the time uh, allotted, and then it takes it back. Um, but I don't have to be an expert in, in uh, my infrastructure security here that's been surfaced through Security Center just by basic installation, which is really turning it on, and very basic configuration. Um, so if I drill into threat protection, this represents that standard tier of coverage. And typically when you, when you hear threat protection, that, that implies intelligence in Microsoft parlance. Um, so if I drill in here, uh, I see some some preview capabilities around Key Vault, some suspicious activities around IP addresses, so some new capabilities. This is actually just an engineer uh, stirring up some activity for us, so um, nothing really to worry about. But but it all gets surfaced right to the top. So let's talk about how you, as the person who who's maybe not uh, a practiced Microsoft cybersecurity resource. How do I turn on Security Center? Well, uh, the basics are there by default. Security Center free tier is there. What I'm going to do is go up here to pricing and settings, and I'll click on my subscription. And in my subscription here, you see there's free tier, which gives us Azure resources only, standard tier, and you see it tells me exactly what I get for that extra cabbage, right? What I get for that extra money. So when I turn on that standard tier, I'm going to scroll down here, and it's going to tell me what this is going to cost me. Now, I can use Azure Policy to enable these features on a very granular basis. So I, it's possible for me to exclude 
certain instances here. And I do find um, we don't have to do that as much anymore because now in the world of, of, of multiple Azure subscriptions being recommended, we typically have production resources in a separate subscription from lab resources. Well, production is where I'm always going to want the standard, the, the standard protection. And in the lab and development, I may not have that same desire because I, I want to be a little a little more thrifty in my test environments, right? And so maybe I'm going to to protect myself there by simply not exposing you know certain resources directly to the internet. But I can come in here on a per feature basis, and I can turn features on and off to uh, to more granularly configure the standard tier. And you notice that there's protection here for virtual machines for app service where you'd see your web apps. SQL Server, storage accounts, uh, your Kubernetes instances, the container registries associated with your Kubernetes instances. So, so we're really getting all the way down to to making sure that our our AKS cluster is configured, that our registries are secured. We want to layer in some some scanning capability there. Um, so, and and Key Vault is where we we uh, deal with where we, we store our secrets. And, and really, I, I can't remember the last time I deployed AKS without deploying Key Vault as well. It tends to be where we store our secrets and we access them there from a pipeline. Now, Steve, and maybe Bert as well, um, alluded to the fact that uh, Azure Security Center uses uh, Azure Policy under the hood, right? So I'm gonna click on Security Policy and we're just going to have a look here. So I'll go to security policy. I'll go to my tenant. And so here I'm just going to look at the security center default policy, just what's happening right out of the box. And so this is going to show me effective policy. And I can see here all of those buckets that we saw in the security center, um, in the security center you know, dashboard, right? And I can see some, some language here that's common to the cybersecurity reference architecture, like identity, which maps to identity and access, right? Uh, data, I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna equate data to information. And, and then I see you know, the basics of compute and app. And if I scroll down here, you can see the policy action. So you see in my environment, I have disabled a few things, um, but you see that it's, it's auditing to look if, if elements exist or not largely um, so let me just go back a couple of steps here here you see those industry regulatory standards remember we looked at, at regulatory compliance and i mentioned that that there were some that are enabled by default it's these four cis PI, uh, pci iso 27001 and SO, soc so if i click on add more standards you'll notice that there are several others here. So if you happen to reside in the UK or Canada, or maybe you're a healthcare organization and HIPAA high trust is of, of interest to you. Uh, maybe you're just trying to implement NIST standards. NIST is actually pretty commonly used in the financial sector as well. SWIFT is used in the financial sector in, in uh, Europe. Um, so you have additional uh, regulatory compliance standards you can light up just by adding them there. You don't need to be an expert. Now, where you can get into deep water, if you'd like to get into trouble, is you can develop your own custom initiative. So remember, Steve talked about an initiative being a collection of policies, right? So we can uh, we can definitely get in there and have a look at uh, at those. Uh, capabilities, but but when you're developing your own, um, you know, your own initiatives, your own policies, this is going to require that deeper level of knowledge. So the good news is, when you get in here and you create a new initiative, what you will find is there are some policies that are some policy templates that are available to you out of the box. So I'm just going to define an initiative, and I want to show you the available policy definition. So just notice here that there are 478 out of the box. So I can define more, but I have a great starting point here. Uh, it's definitely going to take a little bit of trial and error in a tutorial for you to build your own initiative here. And, and, and then you're basically applying that initiative in uh, the Security Center portal. What happens when you apply your own uh, initiative is when you come back here and you look at the, uh, the dashboard, 
and you look at the regulatory, there'll be a custom tab. So, so once you get that in here, when you come back to your your uh, regulatory, sorry, let me go back here and uh, click on regulatory. You can you can basically get to where you have a a custom tab down here. Um, so absolutely uh, worth exploring. But that uh, you know, Security Center is such a powerful feature, and it's so easy to enable. So just getting back to to just you know finishing configuration. So the first step is really just turn on the standard tier. Uh, enable those additional uh, protections. Now, for virtual machines, um, the, um, the Security Center will actually automatically deploy. If I just click on data collection here, Security Center will automatically deploy the, the, the Microsoft monitoring agent to all the VMs in my subscription so it can gather all the information it needs and where it needs to take action on my behalf or I tell it you know, to do the quick fix or what have you. That, that agent is going to help us there. If I scroll down here, uh, you'll notice I can configure the amount of security event configuration that's going to happen in my, my environment. And, and I'll probably set this to common here. Um, you know, there are some things that, there, there are some functions that, that Security Center was, was building, building on a couple of years ago that have really moved more over to, to Azure Sentinel now because Security Center and Sentinel are complementary. And I wanna talk to you about that briefly. But once you've enabled this, for your once you've turned on that standard tier enabled for your your virtual machines and turned on uh or off any of these protections that you want by default these are all going to be on so so really if you're turning these off it's because you 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 know don't want to pay for that enhanced protection for whatever reason but you want to justify your way out of that if you can afford it um so let's let's keep plugging along here we've looked at, at some of these dashboards but i want to talk about Security Center versus Azure Sentinel, because because I do hear a lot a lot of folks saying these seem like they overlap. What exactly is the difference between Security Center and, and Sentinel? So you saw with Security Center, it has a really strong compliance element, right? It has has a configuration management element. It's really helping me to understand if my my identity, my compute, my my network, my storage my data if, if I'm mapping to best practices. So, so to put that more simply, Security Center is really more collect and detect. Azure Sentinel is, is really, it's a, it's a security, it's a SIM and SOAR solution. And, and the SIM solution is the more common that you'll hear. It's security information and event management. So Sentinel has more than 50 connectors that, that bring data in from all manner of, of sources, which I'll show you in a moment. And uh, amongst those uh, are Azure Security Center. So I can take the alerts that happen in Azure Security Center, I can send those over to Sentinel and say, I want you to turn that into an incident that somebody needs to investigate. So, so Azure Sentinel is where I can investigate and respond to incidents in my environment. Um, if I conceptually map that out, um, you know, Security Center is really over here giving me the, the collect and detect and Sentinel gives me really more of that overarching uh, source of visibility at the most you know uh, hands-on level when we're thinking about investigating and responding to threats in our environment but I can I can plug in a variety of sources so let me just show you Azure Sentinel uh, ever so quickly here and and so I've, I've loaded Sentinel in my environment and enabling Sentinel is not much more uh, difficult than Azure Security Center so I did two things okay uh, when you click on the Azure Sentinel uh, uh, service, it's going to ask you to basically deploy a log analytics workspace. So if I say add, it's going to say basically create a new log analytics workspace, and then it's going to say add Sentinel to that workspace. So click and next and click and next. So if you are, uh, if you have full uh, access to your vision and your uh, your fingers, you're going to get that Sentinel instance deployed just fine. You'll deploy a log analytics instance, you will enable Sentinel, and then where the magic happens is right here in the data connectors. So I'm going to click right here under configuration on data connectors. So this is step three in the grand scheme of things. And, and again, um, I'm giving myself some very valuable visibility and I don't yet maybe understand a lot about the Microsoft um, 
cybersecurity reference architecture. I maybe don't have familiarity with all the products, but these connectors are now going to begin to give me the ability to get some insight. So what I'm going to do is the provider tells me where the connector comes from that ingests the data. So I'm going to get rid of the select all, which has many third party sources of a very impressive list. I'm going to drill down on Microsoft for now. Okay. And so let's look at these together and see what we see. So this will bring in my Azure Active Directory log. So I'm going to click there. I will click on open connector page. And you'll see here, it says, okay, I want to bring in the sign-in logs. I want to bring in the audit logs. Check, check, apply, done. It's gathering that data for me now. Azure Active Directory Identity Protection. If I have subscribed to the plan two, the higher tier, Identity protection, again, I click, I connect, I enable, it's done. And it's that simple. I connect, I enable, it's done. And now it's ingesting. So now it's getting that risk information. If I wanna bring in my Azure, uh, if I wanna bring in my Azure activity logs, again, every bit is simple. Open the connector, check the box, done. Uh, I'm gonna scroll down the list here. You wanna get security events from your endpoints? Very simple, let's let's just bring in those security events. We wanna get that audit trail, right? So here we go, and it's gonna tell you, hey, you need to have an agent out there and you need to set the level of data collection, right? So that's gonna be even more important here than it is in uh, Security Center because I, I'm really doing more of the uh, in investigation and, re and response over here in Sentinel nowadays. I'll keep scrolling, I can set up a syslog uh, collector and I can bring syslog in. Um, Windows firewall. Uh, now there are a couple of, there There are some service connectors in here as well and these are a little different. So so what that first batch of connectors all have in common is they're bringing in event data, right? They're bringing in um, very granular event data. When I get into um, secure, when I get into service connectors here, like bringing in uh, Defender Advanced Threat Protection, this is going to bring in alerts from Defender ATP, and it's going to turn those into incidents. So I'm just, all, all I have to do is basically connect and the alerts get mapped to incidents. Now I do have limited, you know, very limited configurability today. I expect to see this to evolve over time so I can tell Sentinel how to behave as those alerts come in. Um, you know, the capabilities here are always evolving. Cloud app security, we've got some capability here. So here's another service connector that's gonna bring data into my environment. I don't have to know what my identity team is doing with cloud app security to, to establish some, some value here. I can bring in the alerts. I can bring in the discovery logs. It says that's a preview feature. So, so that would be my cloud app discovery log. So that's gonna give me info, you know, insight into what apps are being used in uh, in the environment um but i'm but i'm establishing greater and greater context right so if i'm just looking at my endpoints through defender atp defender atp is very powerful and intelligent uh but it's it's context is limited to endpoints right it's really looking at endpoints and activities related to to identities in in the context of that endpoint and with with sentinel here i'm gathering information from microsoft i'm gathering information from third parties uh, I can analyze that data that I'm collecting. So if I go to analytics, I can light up some rules here that will analyze data. And, and they give me, Microsoft gives me many rule templates. And one of these that's turned on by default is, is the, uh, the machine learning, the AI. It's called Fusion and it's just enabled out of the box. You don't have to configure it. So there's a layer of intelligence that's baked into uh, Sentinel. Uh, that, that gives us a lot of power right out of the box. Now I'm gonna go to incidents here because this is where we, we do our investigating. So I'll click on incidents here. And I should have at least, I've got at least one incident for you here. So, so I see here, it tells me we've got activity from a Tor IP address. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch this. And it says it came from Microsoft Cloud App Security. So I actually got it through one of those connectors. Now down here in the lower right, you're gonna notice there's an investigate button. So I investigate and then the uh, the investigation interface here is gonna give me a visual 
picture of what's happening in this environment and it gives me the ability to pivot and run additional queries. So I can see here's activity from a Tor IP. And if I just click on that incident, I can scroll down and read what was detected. It tells me the IP it came from. It tells me who it came from. Uh, in this case, I see it, it came from somebody I know, so I'm not super concerned. But as I scroll down here, I can I, I get some greater context. If I have if I've created security playbooks which are based on logic apps, I can actually uh, you know kick off uh, automated responses in uh, automated remediation in these cases where it matters. So if I just mouse over some of the related components to the, the related entities here, you'll see for that IP address it says I'll show you related alerts, and there's actually only one. So my context is going to be really limited here. But, uh, but I get visibility right out of the box. And the bigger the, uh, the scope of the attack, the more valuable this gets. And, and those entities you saw on that map were mapped automatically by Microsoft's rule set. So they're doing a lot of that heavy lifting for me. Um, so, so just going back to that cybersecurity, um, that cybersecurity uh, reference architecture. I want to throw that up on the screen. So here we go. So that cybersecurity reference architecture is a lot to work through. But if you break if you break it down, and and you break it into those those logical parts that we talked about, and go have a look at those dashboards. Look at your your Microsoft Secure Score. Look at Azure. Security Center. Go look at some of those connectors in Azure Sentinel and see where it's pulling data from, and you can begin to really break this down and make sense of this. Now, there's somebody that talked about this over at Ignite from a, a different perspective, and I'm going to give you his talk as well uh, in the uh, the session notes. Um, this is a, is a much different tack, but uh, but you may derive something out of it as well. I think it was it was really meant more. Uh, his was meant more as a quick overview. So that being said, that is the end of my session. So I'm going to just scroll down to the uh, the question slide here, and I will open the floor before we move on to the Australian delegation who's going to be joining us here really quickly. So Australia is just waking up. So I'm just going to scroll down here and see what we have. So. Um, what does it do for vulnerability scanning? So, so I'm I'm thinking we're talking we we could be talking about a number of things here. So, vulnerability scanning, there's a number of contexts. So, in the Azure Security Center context, um, you know, we have the vulnerability scanner for your for your virtual machines that will look at the uh, the VMs as well as the uh, the SQL workloads on those VMs. If we think about scanning in the context of uh of defender advanced threat protection on your 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 windows endpoints and and defender atp supports windows 10 and going back uh you know the difference between defender atp on windows 10 and modern um modern uh, versions of windows like windows 2019 and newer is is the kernel so so it's got um, you know, tighter integration there because because really Defender ATP in Windows 10 isn't implemented through an agent. It's a sensor built into the operating system that you're turning on. You're toggling a switch, uh, for lack of a a better uh, analogy. Um, so so does it require an additional agent? So so let's talk agents for a moment. So Defender ATP um, for Windows 10 does not. It's it's a sensor for your for the for your other versions of Windows client and server. It does. It's it's essentially deploying the the Microsoft monitoring agent and and enabling a few extra bits and bobs there. Um, if we're talking about Azure Security Center for our VMs, yeah, we we need an agent there. And uh, and for the stand for for our hybrid for our on-premises resource, we're going to need the standard tier so we can get that full protection out to those uh out to those endpoints um azure sentinel does sentinel require an agent so everything i was turning on there uh that you saw uh for the most part did not require agents so when we're gathering logs from azure ad when we're gathering logs from azure when we're getting alerts from from cloud app security or defender atp um, 
or Azure or Azure ATP. Uh, you know, that's that's service level integration. Now for um, you know Windows Firewall for security events on a Windows machine, yeah, we're we're deploying the monitoring. It's, it's the monitoring agent again um, that's bringing that data in. Uh, you know, Syslog. If we're bringing you know security events in from Linux systems from from your network appliances, Syslog um, is going to be a, a collector that runs on a virtual machine, uh, and you forward your syslogs from all of the appliances and the Linux endpoints you want to work with over to your syslog collector, and that goes up to Sentinel. And you can actually host that syslog collector, that VM uh, on premises, or you can host it in Azure, whatever works. I find a lot of folks host it on-prem simply because they have spare compute capacity there, so it tends to be a little less expensive. Ideally, I'd like that collector in Azure, but, uh, but that is entirely up to you.